So one of the absolute best metal records I got my hands on this year was Artificial Brain's second record, Infrared Horizon. I clocked it as our album of the month back in May, not just because the New York band had delivered a blindingly impressive death metal record, but because thematically it tackled that uncomfortable topic of the collision between technology and humanity and where that might ultimately bring us. They pulled it off in a really interesting way, pointing to a future where, quote, artificial beings are trying to find themselves and what they find isn't pretty. And they did it all through the prism of a suffocatingly powerful record that really did fire on all cylinders. Sticking with our album of the month alumni, last year we named Catalyst's debut album Le Dernier Corpuscule as a serious standout. It's a disturbing and highly ambitious record from the Canadian band, and it's jammed with dark atmospheres, lots of really interesting themes, and it featured a powerhouse technical performance, especially from the band's masterminding guitarist, Phil Tuga, who was channeling a lot of classic Finnish death metal when he brought that record to us. So, two relatively young bands, both pushing for success, both stretching the genre of death metal in 2017, and both delivering blindingly deft physical performances. So when I had the chance to sit down with both these groups, Artificial Brain and Contalist, over a night when they were playing an intimate show together in Montreal, I pretty much jumped at the chance. Also, I have to note apologies in this episode for the somewhat below par sound. It was recorded outside in a busy North American city. You'll hear all of that, cars honking, drunk people shouting, and it's just the way it was. But hey, maybe that'll give it a little bit more flavor. Also, we're happy to say that this episode of the podcast has been sponsored by the Dublin Podcast Festival, which is running at various venues around the city from the 19th to the 30th of September. And there's one show in particular we'd like to highlight. It's the live showing of Welcome to Night Vale, the cult US podcast which centers around would-be community updates for the small desert town of Night Vale. It features local weather, news, announcements from the sheriff's secret police, mysterious lights in the night sky, dark hooded figures with unknowable powers, and cultural events. Written by Joseph Fink and Jeffrey Craner, Welcome to Night Vale is narrated by Cecil Baldwin. Turn on your radio and hide, that's what they advise. And that's happening at the National Theatre on the 28th of September, with tickets starting at 22.50 from all the usual outlets. It really is worth checking out. If you haven't listened to Welcome to Night Vale, give it a go. It's a great idea, a great podcast. Now, first up, we have Artificial Brain's charming rhythm section. This is the Metal Insight Podcast. So I'm here uh, chatting uh, with two members of the wonderful Artificial Brain. We'd have Keith yes. and we'd also have Sam. And uh, the guys are joining me just outside their show uh, taking place at Piranha Bar uh, on St. Catharines in Montreal. So how's it going, guys? Great, great. Very good, very good. Excellent. The last time I saw you guys, you were tearing it up here in Montreal at the Covenant Festival. But that was uh, that was your first time in Quebec? First time in uh, Montreal, I believe, was it? No. Oh, you guys have been here before. Yeah, yeah. yeah right. we, we played here in 2014 with uh, Geigen and Piron. Okay, fantastic. So it really is a, it's an indication, though, I suppose, that you guys are playing here again, that you guys are kind of stretching your legs. And like, would it be fair to say that the band at this stage, I suppose, after the release of the second album as well, are ramping it up and playing a, a few more live shows and shaking a leg? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we're getting more opportunities to play a bunch of different cities that we haven't been in and uh, definitely coming back to cities we've been in before. And it's just always a pleasure to come back to Canada as a whole, but to Montreal specifically as well. Yeah, uh, we've had really good experiences here. Um, You know, both of the shows we talked about, the Covenant Fest and also that that gig, you know, back in 2014, Mm -hmm. before we had really done much, you know, Labyrinth Constellation had just come out, but that that was one of the best shows of that tour. Yeah, so we we love it here. The fans are really great. Oh, yeah. Awesome. I suppose there's, a, there's kind of a, a special aspect to the show that's going on tonight in that you guys are playing with your label mates, uh, Catillist, or however the heck you pronounce that. Yeah. Um, and it would have been a case where you guys actually performed with them at the Covenant Fest. You guys are signed, obviously, on the same label. And um, was it just a case where uh, somebody reached out to you and was like, hey, that was really fun, let's make it happen again? Actually, what we had booked this show before uh, Covenant Festival was... Before we were involved with Covenant Festival. Oh, it was a long-range booking, was it? Yeah, it was long-range, but also Covenant Festival was fairly short notice because another band had dropped off. Um, so Sebastian, who put the show, who put Covenant Festival together, got in touch with us sort of like, it was only like a month and a half in advance of yeah. that show. Um, so we jumped on that because, you know, it was obviously an amazing opportunity and Gorguts were playing and it had, it had been a dream to play with them, so... Um, you know, we were obviously going to do that, but but this, yeah, we had been looking forward to for a long time because we love Catalyst. Mm-hmm. They obviously, you know, share like we're on the same label as them. Um, they both 
we both have like Paula Girardi artwork, <laughs> <laughs> logos that look kind of similar, which is like a superficial thing, but we share a lot of musical influences, Demolich being like a, a really big one. Um, yeah. They're definitely, when I see the two bands together, and yeah, the logos are both killer and both full of tentacles, and <laughs> both very much, you know, uh, they're in the kind of uh, the, the death metal realm with the Finnish influence and with lots and lots of, uh, of technicality going on. In terms of your your first experience with that band or, or how you, you guys got to know each other, what, what were your thoughts on, on Kodilis? Like, is it a case where um, you followed them through, or did you, where did you first get to know or hear about them? Uh, I, I guess we had all... Uh, we had heard the demo uh, before um, their full length came out. We all really dug that stuff. We didn't, I mean, you know, at Covenant Festival, we didn't even have the chance to, to see them because we all had uh, work and stuff like that. So we, we just came up for the day we played and uh, missed them. I think Oleg knows a couple of the guys a little bit, and Jan, our guitar player, is not here, has toured with one of them. But you know, we don't we don't really know the guys at all. Oh, We've had the okay, chance right. to talk to them today. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, yeah which has yeah, just yeah. been with killer. But um, yeah, it's an interesting experience meeting a band like that because we obviously have so much in common, mm -hmm. but we don't know each other. So like, <laughs> there's immediately this like similar vocabulary and like shared life experience that makes it really rewarding or something. It's been several months now since the release of the new album, and the album seems to have just been 100% critically acclaimed from everywhere that I can see. The reaction teams have been very, very warm. There's a lot of you know, very, very strong reactions to the first album as well, of course, but I feel like the second album seems to have gone down very well for you guys, and I suppose something that uh, stands out is this, this great tour that you've been booked on now, and it's coming up with Full of Hell, uh, <coughs> Revocation, and yes. also, of course, Cattle Cup Days. Yes. Maybe you could just tell me a little bit about, about that, how it came together. Did the slot just kind of come along? or? Well, we, we actually were working on doing something with Full of Hell. We, we, we talked to them a bunch of times about trying to put something together, and then uh, I think we were contacted by Cattle Decapitation as well, right? And yeah. These were two separate things that we were trying to work out, and we, we didn't think that we'd actually have the time to do it because they would overlap, and then uh, I guess somehow unknown to me it became one tour which is wow. awesome because we got now we get to do it with, with both of them and then Revocation is obviously uh, an addition to it that helps us out because Dan gets to come along and um, sometimes Dan doesn't always get to do the stuff that we do because he's busy with Revocation so being close with Revocation having experiences with Full of Hell and uh, we had met Cattle Decapitation back in 2014 when we played in San Diego and so it, it just seems like this is the perfect opportunity to to tour with uh, a package of bands that are also friends and, and um, to really get down to business and, and, and tour the country and have the confidence uh, that we almost didn't really have back in 2014. And, and you know, now we have some shows under our belt, we have some experiences under our belt, and uh, I think it, it's just like the perfect culmination of like, like I said before, not only friends, but, but past experiences, and now we can actually hit new cities and uh, really <laughs> get, get after it. <laughs> yeah. No, absolutely. But I suppose what, what struck me when I saw that thing getting released was that you see tour packages go around, you see like a main headlining band and a, and a bunch of bands, and you know, you're like, okay, some of these bands are buy ons, obviously, and some of these bands are, you know, obviously working hard and getting in there. But when you see four bands of that quality, it obviously looks like somebody is within the bands organizing this or pulling the strings or making it happen so that these, these groups are touring together. It, honestly, it strikes me as one of the, the strongest packages for someone who's into kind of death metal or underground. Like intense extreme music that's going to be doing our hands for, for quite some time. Yeah, I mean, we feel the same way. You know, um, a lot of these package tours have buy on bands, but they also have bands that, that are big that don't have to buy on, but that are put on the tours as sort of like a, a like, um, maybe slightly craven, like, mm -hmm. you know, you, you get a band that's big with the kids that maybe you don't really like because it's going to help your draw. Right. And like this tour, doesn't have that, oh, which yeah. is really, I mean, oh, yeah. it has no draw. It's yeah. fantastic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just pure, like, riffs and non really intense noise. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah. So that's, that's, I mean, that's why I'm really excited about it, because this is a tour that, you know, we're, uh, like, 
I would go see. Yeah. You know, um, I really I feel like it's an actual you know, death metal tour. Too, yeah. Which is, and I mean, that's. I, I think the allure for me is, you know, like I tell people this all the time. You know, luckily I'm I'm in uh, this position where I get to play now. But we're we're all fans of of death metal and, and this t style of music. So uh, I remember a couple of years back, uh, Cattle Decapitation came out with um, Monolith of Inhumanity, and and I played that album into the ground and like yeah. I didn't really get to talk to them too much when we met them but uh now to be able to spend some time on the road with them it's almost like I'm hanging out with like one of my favorite athletes growing up you know what I mean it's like I, I, I get to actually hang out with like death metal celebrities it's like it's actually pretty <laughs> cool you know yeah, and I think you said this is a really cool aspect of the fact that you guys are actually going to have uh, another member, Don, actually playing in uh, Reputation as well, which will add a, something special to it as well. That guy's going to be 100% exhausted at the end of every night. <laughs> well, uh, I, well <laughs> I played, uh, when we toured in 2014 with, with Piron, um, I, I played with Piron as well. I, I did the whole double duty thing. And, ah, okay. Uh, it, you know, people would say, like, all right, you're drumming. First of all, drumming is exhausting, right? Mm -hmm. And, like, so you're drumming every night, that's exhausting on its own, but now you're playing for Artificial Brain, we, we have some tough songs, whatever, you know, and then you have... Understatement that it gone down century. I mean, <laughs> whatever, I appreciate that, but uh, uh, then you have Piron, which is fucking ridiculous. Right. If I could just um, tell them how unhappy I was to have to learn those songs, that was, that was bullshit, but uh, it, was, it was an awesome learning experience, and I, I think... Dan is probably the luckiest guy on the tour because he gets to get both worlds on the same package. He, he gets mm -hmm. to have something that he, you know, Artificial Brain is is like his creation. That the, the, All the songs have been written by him. For the most part, obviously, it's everyone's uh, it's everyone's work, but you know, the, the dude put in a ton of work for Artificial Brain and puts a ton of work in for Evocation, and to be able to do both every night, it's like probably a dream come true for him, and, and for us to have him um, on stage with us, and then to also be able to, to play with someone like Revocation as well, is just like, it, it's a win-win for everyone. I, I, yeah. I think we're all super lucky to, to be a part of that package. I'm gonna pivot a little back and just look, or just talk for a little bit about uh, Infrared Horizon, and let it the dust to settle a little bit, and it's been out for a little bit of time, and you guys have, um, you know, been able to step away from the the recording and the uh, the releasing process, and now it's out there in the world, and it's 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 alive and it's moving around. Uh, we distribute the podcast through MetalIreland.com, and it, we got the album in a month from us when it came out, um, like a shot. The impression I got on that album was that, you know, it, it's funny because it, obviously it was recorded in the same studio. You guys went and did it in Thousand Caves again with, with Colin Marison. But the, the the whole flow of the album seemed to come in a, in a far more kind of a condensed, I don't want to say like less, less um, like the songs are less complex or anything like that because the songs are incredibly complex in how they go. But what I would really love to know is just how, when you guys uh, listen back to the songs or when you perform them live, like, and you compare the material from that towering first album to this second one, like, how do you feel about it now? Do you, is there a division in your mind between in the first and second album songs when you played them? Uh, yeah, I mean, for me, I think there is. Um, to me, the, the Labyrinth songs sound... Um, just in the composition, like far more kind of open, um, and like the harmony really has room, like more room to breathe or, or something like that. And uh, infrared is just like suffocated and, and like very claustrophobic and like more, you know, there's more of that like muted tremolo picking thing. It's like more jagged. It's just like kind of an uglier record, um, and like that. You know that com that comes from the production, but I think the production is the way it is because the material dictates that. Uh, I, I was actually talking to the Catilus dudes about this uh, not too long ago, about an hour ago, about how um, the the main difference for me uh, really comes from the confidence that, and I, I know I mentioned this earlier, but it, it was the confidence that we didn't have, or, or at least speaking for myself, that I didn't have in Labyrinth. Um, you know, no one knew who we were when we were recording Labyrinth, and uh, we just kind of did what we knew and, and hoped for the best. Now it's like infrared was coming out, people were expecting something, and like I said before, having the experience, it was like we had something, for lack of a better way to put it, we had something to prove, uh, and we had a little bit better chops, and, and I think we, we wanted to get something done. and. 
uh, we drilled the songs and we wanted to be faster, we wanted to be more powerful and, and I think that especially because we're, you know, to say the least, we're, we're like part-time musicians. We all have jobs on the side and we all have everyday stresses and, and to come together to get out this kind of album is like, you know, there's anger behind the songs, there's frustration behind the songs, there, you know, like, when I'm, when I'm blasting, I'm, I'm pissed, like, I, I, I want to be pissed, I, I want to hit the drums as hard as I can, and I, like, I think the difference between Labyrinth and uh, Infrared was, um, I wanted to be heard as almost like a, a more an older an older drummer or like like an older band like now we're we're not beginners anymore in a sense like I you know I'm not saying we're like professionals now we're not like veterans at all but uh, we we had we had something to prove with this album we wanted to show that we weren't just here for one album you know yeah. what I mean it was like you know we we. We fucking love death metal, and, and we wanted to show people that we took it seriously, and I, I think that was the best part about Infrared Horizon. I mean, I totally hear what you're saying. A word that gets thrown around a lot, especially, it's a, it's a cliche on the second album, is maturity or progression or, or words like that, but I definitely noticed that there was, like you said, this kind of condensing of what was going on, and the songs are, it seems, shorter almost, but um, just ferocious and full of elements that are just flying around. One of the things that I noticed, and I think you mentioned it too when you were saying you're playing and there's so much intensity and anger in that album. Um, it's very thematically rich, the record. I feel like lyrically listening to, to, to Will uh, sing, um, obviously it's really hard to make out what he's saying, <laughs> but from other interviews he's given and what he's talked about in terms of the inspiration for that and this whole idea of the, the future, you know, the technological singularity and the place of humanity in the future as it, as it, as it goes. I'm just wondering, like that that whole idea and the whole team and the lyrical focus that went around there. Like, how much does that actually play into your performance? Because you guys are involved in this intense technical workout, and you are just having to, to perform at the top of your abilities and push yourself. Yeah. But do you get to like actually engage with what he's saying there through your performance? I mean, it's a, I know it's a tough question, but uh, well, honestly, the the lyrics. I, I would like to say that that's the case, but the, lyri <laughs> the lyrics are actually written um, after the songs are already finished. Right, I agree. So there, there's not any, yeah, there's not any space for like dialogue there. But I will say that that um, how um, what you're talking about as far as like the record being more like thematically cohesive or something is like really something that we all were thinking about with you know with how the material sounded and. Um, the artwork and the lyrics in a way that that we felt like we we um, neglected a little bit with Labyrinth, which is a little more all over the place. Sure. So I, I think in that way we like maybe um, matured a bit, or or at least tried to. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and, and I think one of the best things about it, like uh, you know, as Sam said, how the, the lyrics are sometimes written after the songs are already put together. Um, Every member is is given space to kind of express themselves, and like Dan will have, like, say he writes a song, I'll have some drum parts in mind, but he'll give me the space to add my own feelings to it, add my own touch to it, and I, I think the, one of the the cool things about uh, Will is um, he. He has a way of adding a very human element to lyrics that may not come off as human, you know, because like the, the themes and the concepts, but like he has a very good way of adding symbolism um, that's like when you read the lyrics and, and you know Will, you could kind of see that it's like uh, an everyday person's problems, you know, like just going through day to day life, but put together uh, in a way where it's kind of like outside of it as well and, and I think that the the space that we give each other is so important and, and there's there's rarely ever any fights there's rarely ever any any members putting each other down with parts that we try to put into it and it, you know there sometimes we'll think of something and and the band will be like ah it's not really gonna work but for the most part everyone has freedom and everyone has their own input and I, I think that's you know once again it's what I already said before but like as fans of the genre 
we get to that's where we get to really put our influences into the band and that's, that's really what I think makes artificial brain what it is it's like yeah. we all come from different backgrounds of the stuff we listened to when we were younger and the experiences we've had as people and then just kind of putting our own spin on it and, and, and will you know writing lyrics and making it a concept really make it unique and that, that's something that I love about the band for sure so it's been out now as you said for a little bit of, a little bit of time do you still go back and listen to it uh, no uh, I mean, I, I, I personally, it's it's an anxiety thing, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I can't listen to anything I'm on. I hear you. Um, yeah, I, I just, especially like, you know, we, we have this recording ethic and Colin does too, where, where you know, we're, we're going to let little mistakes seep, you know, like stay in, in we don't want to fix them because that kind of stuff gives a recording character. Yeah. But <laughs> on yeah. a personal level, yeah. when I listen back and I hear those little mistakes, I get a little crazy. Um, it, I yeah, I don't really like to listen much. But I mean, some people are different. <laughs> uh, well, Labyrinth. I I don't even know the last time I listened to Labyrinth. Yeah. It, it. I almost cringe when I listen to it because uh, I hear how inexperienced I was as a drummer, and and not that I'm like. Uh, any better now, but uh, at least in, in uh, infrared, I, I I listened to it heavily when it first came out, and now uh, it's like okay, that's done. Time to look forward and and try to see what I can get done for the next stuff. And mm -hmm. Dan Dan's written a couple of things that we're looking forward to getting onto the third album, and uh, okay, it's it's a different monster, so I have to step up for that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Well, like you mentioned about moving forward, I suppose the next big thing on the horizon is this, this monster tour um, taking in uh, like 30 plus dates, right? Um, yeah. It's, uh, it's going to be absolutely all over the States. But you've mentioned that music, I suppose, is already being put together and being planned for album number three. Um, would, you, would you imagine like a, maybe a, a 2018 release? Is that a, in mm. any way potentially? No. Okay. No. It, it, I mean, when I say that the, the songs are being written, I mean, Dan... Dan's come up with some skeletons, and and that's pretty much it. No okay. one else has pretty much done anything. The, the drums are non-existent. Dan programs some stuff to give me like a guideline, but it, they they're not they're not anything. I, mean, I hear you. And and I think something that that also is important too is, is like, uh, you know, the the time between Labyrinth and Infrared. I think was one of the reasons why I think we were satisfied with Infrared. And I, yeah. I, I don't think we're at the point where we can bust out another album within a year, and I think that. Uh, it's valuable to take a break and listen to what's out there and, and listen to what other bands are doing and, and kind of breathe a bit and, and see how the genre as a whole is is living and, and, and very much uh, progressing, for lack of a better word, and, and just to kind of, just to enjoy what other bands are doing. Like, like I, I keep saying it, but just as fans, just to be so fortunate to, to be in, in the quote unquote game at this time you know, like we're we were able to play with Gorguts and then, you know, not too long after play with Catilis and then and then all of a sudden we're you know our our best friends Piron put out an, a new album and it's, it's there's just so much going on that we're just it, it's probably more valuable to just kind of sit back and and listen for a little bit. Absolutely, yeah. And I suppose it's another indication that this tour isn't something that's like tour album tour album cycle. The band doesn't exist like that. It's not that sort of organism. So. Makes perfect sense. Yeah. Um, so, great. That's a, that's a really good picture, I suppose, of where things are actually going at the moment now. Um, one of the things I always have to ask, and it's just something I need to, and I suppose we're talking here, obviously, of fans. Like, you guys made a drive up from New York yesterday. Um, what are you listening to? What are you enjoying at the moment in the world of metal or, or music in general? Is there anything that's really pushing your buttons? Hmm. Uh, yeah. It, well, the two things that pop into my mind um, may not be the most obvious things, but whatever, uh, I guess I'll say it. Uh, Aphex Twin is a is a huge influence. Um, may not make sense as an influence of, of death metal, but like it's something that gets me hyped up. Um, for percussion and uh, and Kendrick Lamar's new album got oh, yeah. me extremely hyped up. Uh, I know, obviously, two things that are not metal, but really getting me excited as a person that is involved with music, and it, it's it's just a, a good time to be creating music and and hearing the different outlets that people have and, and the different perspectives that people have. Yeah, for, I mean, for me, um, 
some of the things I've been listening to. The, well, Keith just mentioned the new Piron record. I've been listening to that a bunch. Oh, yeah. That's amazing. It's, I mean, I think my favorite Piron so far. I've been really into this band, Jute Gite, um, which is like a one-man band. Um, and it's like bizarre microtonal stuff. Um, yeah, he put out something this year, but he puts out yeah something every year at least. Um, that stuff's really cool. Um, I'm really excited for the new record by um, Abigor, um, which they've only released samples of, but but sounds really cool. That's a band that's been a big influence for us. I suppose one thing I suppose I'd like to go back to and mention here: we don't actually have Will performing tonight. Uh, we have a stand-in, of course, because Canadians get this guy and no one else seems to, to right. really get him. Who is your your stand-in tonight? What's his his background? Uh, our stand-in is Paulo Puguntalan. Mm -hmm. He's on both Labyrinth Constellation and Infrared. He's on, I think, three songs on each. Yeah. Um, I think maybe the the most uh, notable thing that he does is like those really insanely high-pitched pterodactyl kind of screams <laughs> yeah. um, on both records. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, being that he's on so much of our material and he's a good friend, yeah. it seems like a, a natural fit and, you know, he helps us out. He's done a couple of shows in the States with us too and he'll do some more in uh, when we're um, on tour with Cattle Decapitation. But sure. yeah, mostly just Canada because of legal stuff. Will obviously has a great reputation as a, as a live performer. He has those crazy glasses that he puts on. He's a giant, like, lumbering cyclops out there to the kill people with death metal. He has, a, you know, obviously an amazing vocal record, but you're, you're, you're filming as well. Like, man, the performance he put in last time was just 150%. I seem to remember him blast-beating the mic off his forehead <laughs> until, until blood came yeah. pouring out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think we're very lucky to be involved with people that really take it seriously and... and and love it enough to put in the work. And I mean, when we were recording Labyrinth Constellation, Colin Marston said it best about Will. Um, he, he's a master of death metal. He, he really, he's been doing it his whole life. Uh, you know, there he's extremely unique and, and he he's a presence, man. I mean, there, there was a show we played not too long ago in, in Philadelphia that was like a pre-fest show for uh, the, the Decibel Beer and, and uh, right. Metal, metal, fear metal. I think it was yeah. metal. Yeah, crazy yeah. word. Huh? <laughs> but um, I mean, we had we had to change a string, and Will, it was basically just stand up comedy, man. And and he was the crowd was just hysterically laughing. And I think one of the reasons why I I personally am so comfortable on stage is because Will, it, it, he just kind of makes us feel at home. He he, yeah. he makes everyone laugh, and even Paulo. You'll, you could go on YouTube and search some of the shows that we have with Paulo where you could catch him popping and locking on stage. He's just <laughs> dancing and like, you know, it, it's just there's something about really feeling comfortable when you perform that, that lends itself to the, to the genre. I mean, you know, it's, it's death metal. It's supposed to be aggressive. It's supposed to be mean. But there's something about, I always tell people, the difference between, uh, I don't know, whatever, the difference between black metal and death metal is like, black metal has that kind of like mysterious and that kind of like dark allure to it. But death metal is like a bunch of idiots drinking beer and having fun. And I say idiots in like a good way. You know, like, I, you know, I'm not putting it down, but, you know, we're all just kind of like regular guys wearing regular clothes, drinking beer, having fun, laughing, and, and just fucking ripping music, you know, blast beats and shit, man. It's just, it's just fun. And we finished off that chat with Artificial Brain by talking about how the band have bizarrely not been booked by anybody in Europe yet. Why? Not even a festival. So if you're listening, promoters, you know what to do. Next up, we spoke to Phil Tuga of Canadian group Catalyst after their show, and we got a really great insight into how he prizes total performance whenever he takes to the stage, as well as how he manages that band, plus the multitude of other projects that he has ongoing at any one time. He really is just a... A man with so much going on. You're listening to the Metal Insight Podcast. Did you enjoy the show? How did it go for you? I think it went well. Uh, obviously, um, um, it's never perfect. We have to practice more. <laughs> we have to practice more. Um, but I think in general, the energy was there. Uh, maybe it wasn't the best uh, show we've played overall. But I think with the uh, energy that we brought to the crowd and the response to it, I think it was overall a very memorable, memorable show. But it seems like the band has morphed now quite uh, considerably from maybe a recording project, a project that was more built around uh, finally producing the album into a pretty cohesive live unit now. 
Yeah, well, I mean, um, the thing is, these shows must be unique because we don't do them a lot of, you know, we don't do a lot of shows. The thing is, because of our, you know, busy schedules, um, uh, Phil, our drummer, is very uh, busy with uh, Beyond Creation. Uh, myself, I, I have uh, another array of bands, so in order to bring this music to the next level, we have to think about the fact that we're not going to play a lot of shows and a show, Aktila show, is an experience you see rarely. But yeah, it's just, I mean, it, it has to be cool if it has to be heavy and memorable because it's not something you will see often and it's an extremely big challenge, especially because the atmosphere on, on the demo and the album is very uh, particular. A lot of um, effort went into the mixing and uh, the attention to detail, it's not, not everything is going to be too going to be recreated live but we tweak the songs a little bit to fit more into a, a live setting you know a lot of people said Ktilis the album was too theatric and oh they rely too much on effects and I live they would probably just be a, a gimmick band but no you see when you you see Ktilis live it's raw in your face and the, what you hear is what you're gonna get and I got the impression of a very uh, kind of full-bodied straight up death metal performance very little kind of um, pauses for samples, nothing like that was going on. This was a band who was like playing songs, playing riffs, keeping up the intensity. Exactly. That I um, I can't understand that the first impression of, of certain um, uh, avid music listeners, what they will hear at first. They will say, okay, this band has a very uh, interesting atmosphere. Uh, it's very dense, it's very dark, but can they actually... Um, create something intense um, without sacrifice, sacrificing the atmosphere. I think live, or our approach is kind of different uh, from the album. We decide to strip away all the, how to put this, we focus more on raw energy than um, theatrics. I, we, we love to put a, a certain theatrical elements in our music on the album, but live it has to be in your face, it has to be raw, it has to, you, have, you have to the, the band has to be sweaty at the end of the performance and they have to be tired, otherwise it's not a successful successful show, you know. Of course, you were sharing the stage with your label mates, uh, Artificial Brain, who traveled up from New York for the show this evening. How did you get to know about that band, or uh, what are your opinions on them uh, and uh, the kind of the assault that they brought this evening? I really love them. Uh, I think they um, they have the right influences, they have the right uh, mindset when it comes to creating music. Set up the show together a bit because we felt Okay, we come from a similar musical background. We have uh, fans that uh, share the same interest in, in both our bands. I mean, it's logical to put something together. I mean, regardless if we know them personally or not. Or not. And I mean, turns out they're fucking great guys. And you know, just before the show, I was nerding out on, on uh, uh, Final Fantasy games with the, the bassist. These guys are cool. Uh, I enjoy their presence, and um, they're, 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 le they're level mates, yeah, but the, uh, the mindset that we have um, links us together, right? and I think this is what uh, one of the reasons why the show was success successful. There was a, 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 it was fitting. When I was chatting with the two guys, I was talking to Keith and Sam uh, before the show, and we were talking about influences that they, uh, that they absorb naturally as music fans. The impression I got when I first heard La Donia School and it got album of the month actually on, uh, on the website on, on Metal Ireland. I really got the impression that when you were putting that together there, that it was the work of somebody who was, let's say, a connoisseur of, of underground death metal. I felt there was touches and flourishes there that kind of paid homage to like a broad yeah. range of like very, very wide and diverse music beyond just say like the, the great Finnish bands like, mm -hmm. like Demolik and Andromalek yeah, yeah. and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Playing live, has it given you any sort of a new insight into the actual songs that have been written and have been put out under the name, or is it very much just an organic pushing out of the songs that have already been written? Well, the thing is, um, I, I wrote all the album, right? Yeah. So it, all of the influences come comes from me. Mm -hmm. But when we play live, or difference in or, or playing styles match together, so you can you could say that this diversity comes alive more so in a live setting because over we have uh, you know just Claude and I we have a very different uh, approach when it comes to uh, lead guitar playing but it still meshes well and um, the drumming Phil uh, Phil's an alien um, I, you know you, you never studied you never studied mu music mm. you never like learned other styles of music but his, his style is so you have the feeling that you, you could you could play in a jazz band or you know, something like that. So I think you listen to the riffs themselves. Okay, you can you can 
you can detect ints of this band or that band. But this is just on a recording. This is just when you analyze the riff note by note. But when it comes to the live performances, it's, in my opinion, I don't think we can be compared to directly to something because we have performances that are brought together. It's so there's so much there's such a wide array of, of different ideologies and, and musical influences that come together that it becomes another entity. So that's why uh, that's another reason why our live performances there they stand out from the album. The second album we're writing, which by the way is not going to be released anytime soon, is going to be it's going to take years to write. Uh, it's going to be uh, another thing completely from the first album. Not necessarily. Uh, um, we're not toning down the intensity or the over the topness, but the sound is becoming more eclectic, and that's the result of, of bringing together. Uh, a wider, wider range of uh, wider array of influences. I, I've been listening to a lot of Ceremonium late, lately, the second album, mm -hmm. and I've noticed how this band has, you know, they have, they have, they have the, their death metal sound on, this, on the, their second album, but their doom and black metal influences come together in a, in a really unique way, and this is something that really impressed me. Like, I've, mm -hmm. like I never heard this kind of sound before, and this is something like, wow, I, I want to to create a, a you know a, a death metal sound that is you can't really pinpoint the the, the, the some jar so it's it, it's going to be death metal there's going to be black and doom and neoclassical metal influences it's going to be very cohesive uh, obviously it's going to take a lot of time to to write because uh, of how just we're just pushing our sound to an intense eclectic direction in the immediate future we're looking at splits can i ask with whom uh, yeah, well, I mean, we have the, we had this a split schedule with Blood Incantation, but uh, the split I called it off because the material I wanted to include in the split was too eclectic. The, it, it's, it was too eclectic for what we like. I like explain what we wanted to do with the splits to create more simple music. Meanwhile, while we were writing com more complex music for the second album, which is going to be more epic. So I, I told myself this new song should go on the second album instead of the split. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and the mu the music that we were, the other songs that we had, they were not like Blood Incantation is an amazing band. Like, oh, yeah. uh, and honestly, if we had put a, out a split with them using the other material we're writing, it, it would have been too different. Mm -hmm. It would have been too different. It would, we would have been completely like, we would have looked like shit. They, they played the exact same venue as the show tonight uh, last year, and it was just a, a supreme display. I, I was there. I, I was yeah. there. They, they crashed at my place, actually. Uh, oh. Yeah, but like I said, I told them, um, the music we're writing right now, the only stuff that's going to fit with your music is going to come out in a, another release, so it's not it's not going to work because there are other songs they are not on par with your material. It's as simple as that. So we decided, okay, well, this other song we have, okay, well, we could do it with your other band, Spe Spectral Voice. So right. that's what, what we're going to do. And we have other plans for other splits. Uh, I'd rather not go into details right now because there's a lot of details that need to be sorted out. But there are, we're pl we plan to do a four-way split next year. It's a nice balanced approach. It means yeah. then that fans aren't going to be waiting no, exactly. uh, forever. Exactly. They're exactly. going to get little bite size before then. And if if Spectral Voice have just put out their debut album very recently, and uh, by all accounts, it's going to be one of the albums of the year. Yeah. So yeah, uh, absolutely. I'm sure that's going to be a, a pretty killer split. Yeah. No. Um, you know, Spectral Voice. Um, you know, the reason we why we like I said with Artificial Brain, but with Spectral Voice, the reason we, why we wanted this collaboration, uh, aside from being friends with them, we have the same approach when creating music and the same mentality so it was more than fitting uh, more than appropriate to uh, release music alongside with them uh, and uh, this they have their this whole finish sounding stuff too which you know obviously you know it's a no-brainer that we, we would create something uh, release a split together I mean. so would you see a kind of select small number of shows continuing to happen for Catillist? As you said, you don't want to oversaturate or... Yeah, well, uh, we're doing Maryland Death Fest. Um, you know, you mentioned the word selective. This is exactly uh, our mentality. We are extremely selective with, with the shows we're uh, being offered. I, I mean, I, I know it sounds pretentious, but I mean, you're not going to play a show with a bunch of different bands that doesn't bring the same crowd and doesn't bring 
you know, this doesn't work in the same way you do when it doesn't have the same mindset and the same and the same views and the same uh, approach. I mean, we're not gonna jump on every opportunity we get. We turn down so many shows, not because we dislike the bands, not because we dislike the booker, it's just doesn't fit. Beyond Catalyst, you are a busy man. You got a lot of projects going on. Yep. And, um, you know, some of them will be first fragments. And I noticed as well that it looks like you've taken on uh, guitar duties for a venerable and very killer uh, US death metal band, which would be Free Navarro. Yeah, exactly. One of my favorite bands. One of my yeah. favorite bands. I was uh, very honored to be off. To be off You're a full blown member now. Yeah, I'm actually, like, I've already started writing music for them. We have all uh, or different. Uh, approach when it comes to writing music, but it, it all comes together so well. We, uh, it's it's, it's going to be fantastic. Uh, we have a couple of shows coming next year. Uh, obviously, this is not something I would I would not go into detail because it's not all firm. Mm -hmm. But these shows are going to be really they were they're going to be extremely um, worthwhile, and I can confirm also that there will there will be Montreal shows. Great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. That's good to hear. Um, Funer Barham obviously are, uh, are you know, an excellent death metal band who have been active for, for many years. Yeah. Um, what else have you got going on at the club? Uh, well, I have Zolotry, a uh, studio project. Uh, we're, we just finished writing the third album. We're going to record it at the end of the year. I have a, uh, another band called Sorox, uh, a tech death band. From, uh, you're originally Mexico which extended uh, its lineup to members from Finland and the uh, United States and eventually Quebec. By the way, our, our, our bass player, Katilas, is now uh, filling, uh, filling the shoes of our ex-bass player. Uh, the ex-bass player was the one of the ex-members from Monstrosity. And so it's big shoes to feel, to feel, yeah, yeah. feel but he's, he's very up to the, he was up to the, to the challenge and he's uh, we're writing, we're, we're recording the album as we speak right now. Uh, I have a Funeral Doom project, which is, um, you know, I've written the material five years ago. I, I was in a not, not so pleasing mental state, and this pretty much came out of its own. Like, honestly, right now, I cannot write music like this, because five years ago, I was in a different mindset. So even though it's old material, and it reflects a different mindset, my mindset from now, we are still putting out this album eventually. We're actually we're working on the artwork and uh, recording pre prods for production tracks. So eventually that's going to come out. It's it's just the two tracks, but it's around 40 minutes. It's a, some extremely um, some extremely uh, soul crushing funeral doom. You know, it's, you won't be able to listen to this album if you're having a good day. And it's been maturing in its own juices uh, yeah. for five years. Yeah, exactly. It's been it's been shelved for a while. I, I didn't, I never had a lineup. But pretty much, eventually, the guys from Ketilas took an interest in this material. So this band pretty much is the Ketilas lineup, minus the drummer, and we have a keyboardist also. Who, do, we, do we have a name? Uh, yeah, Atrem Atremantus. Atremantus. I also have joined, uh, this, it was, this will surprise you, I have joined a power metal band. Oh, shit. Uh, yeah, from Europe. Uh, not gonna say anything for now. Uh, we're writing an album. Probably won't come out uh, until next year. It's be a well-known band. No, no, not at all. Very underground, but extremely worth it. I'm a huge power metal fan. Uh, well, it's my favorite style of music. So uh, mm -hmm. delving in power metal, doom metal, death metal. So it's I I like to keep uh, open mind. How comfortable are you now? Is it now second nature for you to? log on to Skype and talk with members or email files. Is that now something that's literally part of your DNA? Yeah, I bring well pretty much every day. I have almost, well, if not more bands uh, that were that were born out of the internet that then, you know, Ktilas and First Fragment are the only bands I have, minus the Federal Doom Project that are, you know, they were formed, you know, by jamming and, you know, and rehearsing. The, all the other projects, were made uh, with people I met on the internet because the thing is in Quebec, you know, you see we have a really huge black metal scene, a huge tech death scene, uh, but uh, when it comes to other style, it's not the most diverse. To be honest, it's very limited in that regard. So um, it has reached beyond. You have to reach beyond to create music you want to do because not everyone is going to be into what you want to write. And it's, I mean, it's a big deal. I mean, uh, we all have our super tastes, but I mean, I. I this music is not going to write, but be written by itself. So you got to find people to write with, and 
can't limit yourself to working with uh, your neighbor. As a music fan, um, I'm going to ask you a difficult question, but one that I ask everybody. If you can narrow it down, what's floating your boat now musically from any genre? One or two albums you say that have just been really rocking and you've been enjoying lately, either new or old? Uh, well, um, I've been rediscovering Sword, uh, uh, local heroes, pretty much. Amazing heavy metal. Like, honestly, it surprised me. It su surprised me when I heard uh, meta Metalized. It just it's Spanish from Quebec. No <laughs> fucking way. Mm -hmm. it sounds like fucking Floridian heavy metal. It's perfect, you know. <laughs> uh, Storm Witch. Uh, I've been revisiting Storm Witch from a uh, no, uh, power metal band from uh, I think Germany. Mm -hmm. um, what other bands? I've uh, been listening to a lot of Necromancia on the black metal side. Uh, pretty much rediscovering the whole Greek scene. Mm -hmm. Very much one of my favorite black metal scenes. I've also been listening to a lot of Warlord. Fucking love Warlord. One of the first power metal bands from yeah. the US. Deliver us, right? Yes, and uh, the and Cannons of uh, Destruction, blah, 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 blah. These two releases, uh, fucking monumental releases. Uh, you know, it's, it's that, they have their whole, this whole controversy about them being, being Christians and shit. I don't give a shit. I really don't give a shit. The music is perfect. It's so epic. Gotcha. Um, I mean, otherwise, you know, I just come back to my to my own classics. You know, uh, just yesterday I was jamming the first Queen's Ratch album. Uh, the EP or the album? Uh, both. Uh, Warning and uh, the, the, the four track EP, Perfection. Uh, you know, Crimson Glory, one of my favorite bands, always jam these songs, these, these, these bands. Um, all, pretty much all the shrapnel bands, I always listen to constantly. It's those kind of albums I've been listening to, listen to all my life. You know, Mars, uh, Joey Tafala, Tony McAlpine, those are my fucking idols, man. Like, I worship them. And uh, yeah, Sometimes, yeah, I get in, in a doom, uh, doom metal mood, like you, you were talking about Scald uh, earlier, you know. Yeah. all. Pretty much, when it comes to doom, I'm I'm more into epic doom metal like Scald and, and Solitude Artonis, or you know, straight up funeral doom bands like uh, you know Worship and Funeral from uh, Norway and Turgathon, Evoken, Evoken, fucking, I fucking love all Evoken albums, but fucking Embrace the Emptiness to me is the, the fucking pinnacle of this of this of this style of music. To me, it's not skepticism, it's not Turgathon. I worship these bands, but I'm sorry, Evoken, the first album is the pinnacle of this style of music, and it will never never be surpassed. And I think Phil's love for heavy metal in all its myriad forms is more than evident there. It's really no wonder that we featured him in our recent article entitled Some People Who Made a Difference in 2016. We very much appreciate his sitting down with us. So that does it for another episode. You can, of course, subscribe to the Metal Inside podcast. We are there for you to smash that play button on iTunes, on Stitcher, and on SoundCloud. And very shortly, it will be available for your convenience on YouTube. We'd be delighted also to feature your project, your show, or release through the Metal Inside podcast. So please don't hesitate to get in contact with us if you'd like to be promoted on the podcast. Just reach out to us at mi at metalireland.com and we'll be sure to get you sorted. Just send us an email and we'll be in touch. This has been the Metal Inside podcast number 39. Just don't ever stop heavy guitar.